Hey y'all, welcome back to Bulls with the Bard. My name is Cakes, I am your host. Today, we are continuing our conversation about the problem plays with a discussion about the Merchant of Venice. The Merchant of Venice is officially a problem play. I think it slots better into the second, maybe less popular definition of problem play, which is a problem play that uh, presents some material that is problematic for the time period in which it's being presented, to say the least. Whether or not it slots into the first, more popular definition, we'll discuss that a little bit later. Before we do that, I want to introduce you to our wonderful guests for the day. We have two new friends to the podcast with us. First, we have Terry Burnsed. Terry, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Terry. Um, she was. I am an actor. Um, I'm officially now a failed academic down to one class at Community College of Denver, having once upon a time taught at all three schools at Raria. I am an unpublished scholar, having presented twice, once at a conference on Boulder, on Wild Salome, and once at a conference in Tehran, Iran, on My Name is Rachel Corey. And I just recently did a show with Kate's, with Michaela, Twelfth Night for the Three Leeches. Yes. And I have a play in progress, and I'm working on a performance piece to perform at Josh Berkowitz's, one of his evenings at his gallery. Awesome. Hell yeah. Well, yes, Terry uh, was a very brilliant Malvolio in our 12th night in uh, April. I'm very excited to have you on the show, Terry. Almost as good as your Sebastian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Our second guest with us today is Stephen Reinstein. Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? I'd love to. I'm a, an actor, playwright, um, writer of, of different sorts, uh, occasionally actor, I should say. I'm based out of Boston. I do a lot of teaching, a lot of theater administration sort of work. I've done a lot of stuff out of Wheelock Family Theater recently, and in the distant past, I've kind of gone back and forth there. I don't have anything of, of particular interest to plug right now. I'm just I'm just happy to be here, and that's that's that. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. I was so excited when you reached out. We It's been a long time since we've worked yeah. on something together. Like it, 2015. It <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, back when you were you were one of my my Cumberland Shakespeare Company summer apprentices. Yeah. On Boston Common. That was really, that's a that's quite a throwback. Yeah, back when I was like a baby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sweet. All right. Well, I am so happy to have both of you on the show. I am... I'm kind of excited to talk about this play and also kind of dreading talking about this play. But before we hop in, I'm going to get a little high and y'all are welcome to drink, smoke, do your thing while I do that. Who did you play in? Oh, I was, I, I played such a small part that uh, I was, it was in high school. I played such a small part. Uh, I was um, old Gabo, Lancelot's father. Uh -huh. And it was a consequential part that, uh, I know that there are no small parts, just small actors, but it was such a small part that the director accidentally cut the scene out completely. And then, <laughs> and then the assistant director who'd been working on the scene with me had to go to her and say, you just cut Steven out from the entire play. <laughs> and she threw a phone and like put me back in and a week like I was sort of like, well, this feels like an afterthought. Um all right, y'all. I am nice and lit. We are ready to talk about the merchant of Venice. And I think a good way to get started would be Stephen, you emailed me in our like leading up conversation to this about how like one of the things that this play lacks is a bit of context like yeah. a bit of historical yeah. context surrounding just judaism in general could you talk more about that absolutely i i i'll do a sort of a quick elevator pitch i when i emailed you i sort of it sound, i think it sounded like i was going to do a deep dive into this stuff and i really what i did was i thought 
like four or five sentences would probably just do the trick. Perfect. So um, the play is set in 16th century Venice, which was known for being relatively diverse. I don't want to say it was more diverse than other parts of Europe at the time, but certainly, you know, there were Venetians and Cypriots and Greeks and Turks and Jews, uh, you know, sizable Jewish population. I don't know the demographics, but but it was significant. So they had a presence in Venice at that time. The Jews had, had, had this sort of stake in Venice at the time. And strangely, there are only three named Jews in, in Merchant of Venice. There's no, like, Jewish community to speak of. It's just it's just Shylock, his his friend Tubal, and, and I'm not sure I'm saying that right, and his daughter Jessica, and that's it. You know, so not really not really representative of the thriving Jewish community uh, in Venice. Some of this may seem sort of obvious or or kind of goes without saying, but obviously a big stereotype about Jews is that they are associated with money, infamously associated with money and wealth and and money lending. Uh, that's been a stereotype that's gone on for centuries. The exact origins of it are not clear, but the general consensus is that since the Middle Ages, they were prohibited from owning land uh, and from holding most jobs except for money lending. Money lending was considered by Christians to be sinful, particularly the usury aspect of it, the, the, the interest, uh, charging interest. And so Jews basically said, this is this is what we got to do. And that fit into a mold. Uh, a big a big component of anti-Semitism is the role of the Jew as the scapegoat. You can find any any conflict, any any time throughout history and point to the Jews and say they killed Jesus. They're God killers. They they are capitalists. They they hoard wealth. Uh, they're communists. They they want to deconstruct society they are poor and they're a drain on society they're rich and they're they're the elites so on and so forth you know the, the, like i don't want to get into israel palestine but there's certainly stereotypes there about you know the self-hating jew the the militaristic jew da 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 da, da. and so this sort of th this fits into that this is you know the, in, in this particular case shylock is a is a figure who is he's the bad guy he's the scapegoat he's an easy person to blame for all the problems. He's really the only person who gets tangibly punished, you know, tangibly ends up with anything bad happening to him at the by the end of play. There are certain character interpretations for other for other people, obviously, but I think that that's that he's the one that they they kind of point to and say, we gotta punish this guy. You know, and and I'm not this is this is maybe a discussion point. I'm not gonna. I'm not qualified to say whether or not Shakespeare himself was anti-Semitic. I don't know. I I don't think that that's. You could you could make that argument. You could also look at this text and say no no Shylock is 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 a sympathetic character and he's trying to bolster up the Jewish image and you know he's a victim and da da da. I I I don't think you. I'm, it's hard to be conclusive. It's hard to be conclusive from this text from really almost any of his his works what his social views were and I don't I don't want to be prescriptive about that. But the, oh the other point I wanted to make was Merchant also demonstrates a lot of it it does while I'm not prepared to nail Shakespeare as an anti-Semite, Shylock and Merchant of Venice in general do explore a lot of anti-Semitic tropes. Obviously the role of of the the Jew as the the wealthy money hoarder, there is a whole trope about Jews as being bloodthirsty, and and mm. there's the uh, what's called blood libel, the the notion that Jews actually feed on Christian blood, particularly Christian baby blood. It's delightful. It's really great, you know. And obviously, he's not going around drinking any anyone's blood here, but he is violent, and he does express his vengeance, his desire for vengeance through a desire for violence, disproportionate violence. Um, that's another thing that, you know, Jews also have a very, a, 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 it's, there's a stereotype that Jews have a sense of um, well, persecution, basically, you know, that, that Jews are disproportionately sensitive to persecution. So if you wrong us, we are, we are going to pay back, hmm. you know, violently. And that's, um, I think I'll probably try to leave it at that because there's certainly I could go down a whole rabbit hole of anti-Semitic tropes and particularly those that are explored in this or portrayed in this play. But I think that that kind of gives us a good reference point for what what the foundation of Shylock is based on and and where Shakespeare was coming from in terms of the, the reference point for this play. So there, there it is.
Yeah, yeah. I I appreciate you taking the time to like give us a little bit of context surrounding that character and the history of this play and some of the stereotypes it touches on. I think what's interesting about it is like this play is technically listed as a comedy yeah. in Shakespeare's plays and it does fall into this category of problem play officially and I think that categorization of being a comedy is is part of why it, it feels like maybe in Shakespeare's time some of what he was writing audiences would have just been like riotously laughing at yep. and nowadays it it can leave an audience kind of stunned so my first question for both of you is like do you think that there's comedy left in this play in a 2023 context? Terry, do you want to start us off with that? Well, I think that, first of all, it is worth reminding ourselves that the very designation problem play is a modern one. Hmm. Problem play is a phrase you would not have heard in Shakespeare's day. Although the foundations for its much, much later usage are in fact being laid in Shakespeare's day because we're told that Aristotle laid down for Western civilization, which of course leaves out great swaths of the planet, the binarism comedy tragedy. And yet even that binarism is one that was reinforced by neoclassicism. So I think it's kind of funny that the English speaking world is said to have not been very influenced by neoclassicism, but we sure inherited that part of it big time. Because if something doesn't strike us as fitly called a comedy or fitly called a tragedy, that's one of the reasons that in the 1890s, this phrase problem play arises. Now, as to whether there's any comedy left in Merchant of Venice or not, that is as wildly up in the air as there are actors, directors, and audiences. Mm -hmm. Because who's going to laugh at what? There are things in the play, and not just the anti-Semitism, although that's the most egregious example, of course, but, you know, there are references to people of African descent. There are gender jokes and references to people of Middle Eastern descent, Turks, etc. The Prince of Morocco is said to have killed the Sophie, for example, mm -hmm. in speech when he comes to try his luck at the casts. So there are lots of things that were put there, obviously, for laughs that one would hope a modern audience would be loath to laugh at. But that doesn't mean you couldn't get laughs at other things that would have struck an Elizabethan audience as, what, you think that's funny? What's funny about that? You know, it's a play, whether it is fit to be produced is a valid question and one that makes it a good subject for your podcast. But it certainly does beg the question, if it's not a comedy, if it's not a tragedy, what is this thing? And whatever answer we come up with to that question, what does that say about us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, Stephen, do you have anything you want to add to that? I mean, that's a much more intelligent and articulate version of what I was going to say. But <laughs> but I will say, I think that the problem is that this, this play is, is not a comedy or or is or isn't a comedy. I, th I think the problem is that it is a comedy. I think the problem is that there is a tone to it. There is a pacing to it. There are characterizations to it. Even if you play Shylock completely dramatically, completely straight, there are aspects of this play that don't... Well, the bi the biggest example I can think of is I, I saw a production about 10 years ago at Arts Emerson here in Boston. So the end of the play, obviously, Shylock is is defeated. He's humiliated. He's he's stripped of his I don't think he's immediately stripped of his wealth, but it's it's implied that 
you know, he's, he's basically, he's done. You, you know, you you have to convert. You have to, you lose the trial. You're, you're, you know, you're a schmuck. You get out of here. We're going to take half of it away now. You have to leave. Right. The right. Exactly. And, Jessica. and, um, and as soon as that happens in the production that I saw, they go right into the weddings. They go right into the romance and the tone of that. And I don't know if the, maybe that was the point. Maybe the point was to sort of highlight what this play is and what this play once was. And, and I, I, but I, I left thinking I, I had a bad taste in my mouth. I don't know. I just, I was kind of like, I feel like this portrayal, the pacing of this uh, is, is for one thing, you're not really given a chance to sort of sit with what just happened, sit with just with what just happened to this man, regardless of what you think of him and his actions all of a sudden the, the the focus is now back on the good guys the christians the you know the the people who have learned their lessons and and had a fun time doing it and in that version i believe i mean if you look at the text the text is another 20 pages and depending on how it's cut how it's how it's performed that's as much as another another 20 minutes on stage and i think i i remember in this production that i saw it was it was a long time you're really sitting with the weddings and the reconciliations between the lovers. And, and I just thought, I don't feel like I've been given the chance to digest this. You know what I mean? And, and it, it sort of feels like it's, it's the status as a comedy that makes it harder to, to, to cope with, you know what I mean? Like you're sitting with this, um, the tragedy of this, of this man who has been humiliated, a villain. Yes, absolutely. He's done some shitty stuff, but he's still he's being persecuted he's being punished for things that are not his fault and all of a sudden he's off stage he has no presence on stage he's mentioned a couple times once by name and twice as the wealthy jew and that's it and then everyone else is celebrating all that to say i think it's i think that yes there's comedy there but it's not it's not the way we want to do comedy in 2023 that's my take yeah, I I think you're right on the money. I think that like there is so much heaviness in this play that you you don't get a chance to process at all. And then it's almost like a attempted to be balanced out with this romance plot that has some like awkwardness to it and some charm to how it works. And so I have had moments seeing this play that I have laughed at that part of the play, at the Bassanio Portia wooing elements of the play. But yeah, it's like, it's hard to sit. It's it's jarring to sit with mm-hmm. how heavy the heavy moments are and then feel like it, it, someone's like waving their hand in front of your face, trying to distract you from right. that happening. And, and I will say, if I may, just, I, I, I also think that the modern discussion of this play is almost always around Shylock. And yeah. for good reasons, I think. Um, but I think that because of that, you know, when I when I reached out to you about, about hey, can I, can I participate in this? I realized I actually had to go back and look at what the rest of the play is, what, what happens in the rest mm-hmm. of the play, what the rest of the characters are doing. What is the central theme of this play? I was in it you know, years ago. And I don't think like gun to my head right now, even like, I don't think I could really do justice to what this play, what actually happens in this play without consulting a synopsis. Um, because I'm really just, I, I'm mostly interested in, in what's happening with Shylock. And I mean, that's also a personal thing. I don't do as well with Shakespearean comedies. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving pieces and moving parts. And sometimes you're kind of like, I don't, I, for, I don't, I don't want to speak for other people, but I, I have difficulty with it. But for this play in particular, I look at Shylock and he's actually, he's only like, what? He's in a relatively small portion of the play. Uh, you know, he's, he's the villain and that's kind of it. You know, otherwise it's, it's everyone else. It's the lovers doing their thing and, and up to their shenanigans and, and tricking each other, falling in love with each other, you know, and, and then that's it. And then that's, you know, Shylock is done and he's sort well. of, you know, Shylock looming large, I don't think, is peculiar to you. When you look at the merest glance at the literature, I found John Jerkakis's introduction to the 2009 Arden edition to be really useful. There's some really mm. 
intelligent and subtle and penetrating discussion there. Yeah, Shylock looms large. Oh, he sure does. He sure does. It's, but in terms of it's a different play, you know. Yeah. Now it makes the play the starkest example of Theodore Adorno's famous dictum: "There can be no poetry after Auschwitz." Absolutely. Huh. Well, since we're on the topic, we might as well talk about him. I feel like Shylock is probably one of the most fascinating characters in Shakespeare because he has moments where he is just incredibly beautifully and empathetically written. And he has other moments where he feels like a monstrous stereotype. Mm -hmm. And I am curious if the two of you think there is a way to approach this character that takes some of the stereotype out and mm -hmm. makes him a little bit more of a human, if there's a way to cut around it, or if in our day and age when we have so many examples of more fleshed out Jewish characters, it's just not worth the amount of work that it would take. Stephen, do you want to start us off with that? Sure. This is a really interesting question. I, I, you know, as much as I have issues with this play and Shylock's characterization, if, if, if I understand correctly the premise of your question, which is, you know, how do we, what if we were to water down his character, basically, or, you know, cut around his, his really vile attributes and actions. If we were to do that, I guess my question would be, what's the point? What's the point of his character? And I'm not, and I'm not by any means saying that what is there now is is a good representation. Is a you know, like I don't think it's a positive representation of a Jewish person. I don't think it's a. I think that he can be played in a well-rounded way, but what's on the page is not particularly well-rounded. He kind of waffles between villain and victim, and that's and that's not. I think there's more to a person than that. And and there there can be more to him than that. But I think the danger in eschewing uh, some of the more problematic as aspects of his of his character and stereotypical aspects of his character is uh, what what are we saying? What are we really what what are we trying to portray with this with this character? Sorry, the whiskey is hitting me now. So if I <laughs> if I seem a little less articulate than I was 10 minutes ago, that's what's happening. Um, Not at all. No, okay. I was faking it. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, a, I'm that good an actor. I should play Shylock. Um, no, I think the real problem with Shylock is that his character is, is like I said, like it's it's defined largely by victimhood and villainhood. And what else do you explore with that if you don't have where is where does his depth come from if you if you get rid of his background basically and and as much as his background is based in ugly stereotypes, it comes from something. And you can still create a deep character. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 what I'm trying to do right now is defend the characterization of Shylock, which I hate doing because I, I have so many issues with, with the way he exists, the way he's written. But I, I agree that he's such a beautifully written character that he, he, I want that for him. I want that. I want to see that, that nuanced, tragic portrayal that's not just waffling between, Hey, I'm going to cut out a, a pound of your flesh um, and and screw you out of your money and da da da. Um, I think another avenue for that is his relationship with his daughter, but even that is sort of tied in with with these this sort of dichotomy that he he embodies. I don't know. I, the answer is I don't know, but I think that that's something. I think that it's challenging. You're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you ask me, I think that's totally I, valid. Yeah. We've 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 landed on a lot of I don't knows this season, and I kind of love it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I think the problematic nature of the characterization is exactly what should be underlying mm -hmm. production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you try to cut your way around the disagreeable parts of it, I agree completely with Stephen. You risk trying to excuse. Shakespeare's and his world's and our own anti-Semitism. Yeah. Mm. If you play it too realistically, if you 
try and make him just this guy, then you risk endorsing that same anti-Semitism. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think the way to go is non-realistically. Mm. Huh. You know, of the many ways to approach this that I thought of while, you know, waiting over the course of this week and a half to do this podcast and finally, you know, get in on bulls with a bard here. <laughs> I thought maybe a puppet show. Mm. Because if you have puppets, then you can exaggerate yeah. the monstrousness and underline that it's artificial, that it's imposed from the outside by an anti-Semitism. But then with really good puppetry, you might pull back in some of the most eloquent things mm. Dylock has to say and play those things realistically. Mm. Just let that contrast stand. Yeah. Just wait a minute. He's a real guy. A, he was a real guy a couple of lines ago, and now he's this garish caricature again. Yeah. And, you know, my ideal production would say, yes, that's exactly the point. That's interesting. Well, yeah, that's fascinating. That's, I mean, those are the kind of choices that I think, like, when we ask the question, should we still be producing this play? Like, that's the ingenuity I want to see if we're going to answer yes. Yeah, oh, give a production that begs that question instead of trying to answer it. Yes. Right. That's really interesting. And I I mean, I sat with this question a lot um, and the larger question of, of, do we do this play? Why do we do this play? How do we do this play? Uh, and I'm not a director, so I don't I don't know how to how to execute this with finesse and 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 subtlety. But one approach I thought I, I, I that Terry, that's a really interesting that's a really interesting approach. I would never have thought of that. That's sort of playing into the idea of particularly I think if you if you remove the human faces and you just you have the you have puppets, you have just caricatures basically that are uh, and it's mostly just I mean not mostly I don't want to I don't want to downplay how the, the art of puppetry, but it is a lot of it then is it's a lot of voice acting and it's a lot of physical like caricature physical uh, physical physicalization excuse me. Another approach I thought about was I I want to suggest something where you where where someone were to alter the play and I feel like that's sacrilegious so I'm not gonna really stand by that I know I know I know um, no oh no no on on both. On Bulls with the Bard, we love fucking with the text. Go oh, you for do. It. Oh, love it. Okay, you, you made a face that looked like maybe like I thought I was gonna get I was gonna get exiled here. Um, no, uh, no. Okay, but assuming assuming that that's sacrilegious, and assuming that I would get excommunicated from the theater community um, forever uh, for even suggesting that, the only other option I thought would be something like using a framing device, taking Merchant of Venice putting it within a, like a larger narrative structure the way that like princess bride is or, right. or a better example even um something like uh, uh rosencrantz and gilderstern are dead um huh. where uh -huh. you have you have a it's a mix of modern text and and the original source material but you're contextualizing it differently and maybe then you can have you could do shylock is dead that's a working title but uh, <laughs> uh something like something like that where you have um um he you're showing the the perspective you're showing perspective of i mean not even shylock but just so something else someone else who is enriching what's going on and 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 deepening what's going on you know i mentioned one thing that's missing from this play is context uh and another thing that's missing is a jewish community there mm -hmm. are three jewish characters three named jewish characters maybe you have a story about the other Jews of Venice watching this from afar and wondering what's going to happen to them as as these stupid Christians are fucking around and screwing this guy over. And this one guy is going insane and is literally out for, well, not literally out for blood. That's the whole point. He's out for flesh, not blood. And they get him for that in the end. Um, I have read the play, see? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think there are about a million different ways of doing this. I think what bothers me, though, is when people do this play and then they think that that I don't want to say this is the wrong way to do it, but it's it feels like it's a, a weak approach is to do the play and then 
let's do a talk back. Let's do, uh, you know, or let's put a little comment in the program that says, I'm, there's a time and a place for that. I, I don't want to disparage it entirely, but I think that, you know, when I did it in high school, we had talkbacks. We had, you know, we we did that, and 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 we had a a lot of thought put into what is this play? Why do we do this play? Et cetera, et cetera. I think I'm kind of over that now. I think that now the point is sort of like, well, maybe is there a different way to approach this play that's not just, you know, you frame it with a talkback in a way that sort of forgives the text in a way that sort of says, well, this is just, we're just putting that, we're just presenting this as it is. And after that, we can judge it. And after that, we can pull it apart and say, well, at the time it's da, 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 da. And, and I think I, I'd want more than that. I'd want more than that, than just like, here it is as it was 400 years ago. And we'll discuss after we'll discuss beforehand, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you draw, or you draw your own conclusions. And that's not, that doesn't really feel like, I know we we espouse show don't tell in the theater world in the creative arts world, but I do think that that's it's asking a lot. I I, I don't well, not asking a lot. It's it's we don't need to. We don't. I don't think we need to to ask people to draw our own conclusions. I think we we already know what those conclusions are, and then how do we then meet people where they already are? So huh. there it is. The boldest mm-hmm. production I ever saw was. There used to be an experimental theater company in Denver called the Lita Project. And in the early 1990s, they did a production that they called the Merchant of Auschwitz. And they set it in Auschwitz. And Bassanio, Antonio, Graziano, Lorenzo, all the main Christian characters, and I think Portia too, if I remember correctly, were guards, were Nazis. Wow. And Shylock, Jessica, uh, Lancelot Gobo, Old Gobo, obviously Tubal, the rest of them were prisoners. And they didn't really change the text at all, though they cut a great deal of it. It was a, a really truncated version. But they didn't add much of any text. What came across is that the guards at Auschwitz threw some wild hair up their ass decided to put on this play and forced certain prisoners to participate in it. Mm. And to have a prisoner in that striped prisoner uniform deliver half not a Jew eyes, etc., scared to death that if he doesn't get it right, he'll be killed, and that he probably will be killed anyway. Yeah. That I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do, but it certainly was the boldest thing I ever saw. And in yeah. Blitzer, an earlier production, I saw three curious at the Acoma Center. There used to be a guy who did Shakespeare at the Acoma Center before Curious got started and took over the space. And what and they play it pretty much played it straight, except at the very end, it was blocked so that the only two people left on stage at the end were Antonio and Jessica. Mm. And Antonio brings out Shylock's yarmulke, mm-hmm. but you know, with a and very apologetically, as if he suddenly gets what's happened and his complicity in it, gives it to Jessica. Exits. Jessica is left on stage holding her father's yarmulke. That's the last image that the audience sees. I found that at the time very powerful but i have since found myself going oh come on terry Mm -hmm. is this your way you know is being moved by a moment like that your way and this production's way of letting ourselves off the hook Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's really yeah that's a great point yeah i saw a production of merchant a few years back that had a very similar moment where Portia kind of seemed to have an aha moment in between the courtroom scene and getting back with Bassanio and I I felt similarly I walked away and I was kind of like that just felt like a really small cheap way of trying to forgive that character for all of the horrible things she just did 
without the character she did them to having a chance to have a say about it at all. But with that, yeah, but also an attempt to address the very problem Stephen was talking about before, you know, an inadequate attempt, obviously, but yes, still, to address that, that very same problem you were talking about. Of, Wait a minute. How did we get back to all this comedy all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. How did we get back to all this romance all of a sudden? Because in act four, Shylock exits and like you say, Stephen, we go straight to the rings, you know, with Portia and Nerissa as the lawyers asking Bassanio and Graziano for the rings. Yep. Setting up that whole, you know, that whole very complicated sexual thing with the threat of infidelity in the whole nine yards in Act Five. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh let's dive into Portia a little bit since we're talking about her. Steven, you said like when you first experienced this show, or, or just kind of in general, when you experience this play, like it's hard for you not to just like dig into Shylock. Right. And right. the first time I read this play, I felt that way about Portia. Interesting, yeah. And I, like, but I think it was very much because of the first half that you get of Portia. This this woman who has these restraints placed on her by her father about what she can or cannot do with her romantic life and with his money. And she flips the script and she figures out a way to get what she wants and get to be with who she wants and I think like the first time I read this play that was so exciting to me to see a woman doing that as a woman because she does do all of that stuff dressed as a woman that I almost didn't even recognize what she does at the end of the play <laughs> and although that has changed very much for me as I engage with the play and as I engage with particularly young women who are just starting to engage with this play, a lot of them feel the same way. There's this idea that she is a girl boss, like she is awesome. And it tends to overshadow the fact that she is responsible for Shylock losing everything at the end of this she she, she could have walked away and she makes the decision <laughs> to go as far as humanly possible with what she does and so i guess like similarly to shylock do you think there is a way to redeem a character who does something like that or to justify the actions that she takes at the end of this play or is doing something like that like naive or reductive or like I don't know Terry do you want to get us started with that well I did find one source among your questions that you sent us to prepare for today was what about the queer possibilities between Bassanio and Antonio and I found one source that asked the very same question about Portia and Nerissa yeah huh. Yeah. So there's that. But I was also fascinated by the term girl boss. <laughs> in the early 90s, when I first started graduate school, back in the good old days of actually existing postmodernism, um, we were told, and this was subsequently corrected by a wider view and subsequent history, but nonetheless, we were told at that time that there were liberal feminists there were radical feminists, and there were materialist feminists. Okay. And dirty little commie that I am, I came down on the materialist feminists. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, that makes me view with suspicion the very idea of the girl boss. Yeah, yeah. Because the girl boss is still a boss, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And yet, it's... One source of the connection between all this unconscious and how could it have been otherwise queer theory that Shakespeare seems to have written. We talked about that during Twelfth Night, right? And 
anticipation of a later feminism because, you know, a woman with agency is not enough for me to call it feminism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has, there has to be a mass movement. Yeah. Me to use the term feminism. And I could well be wrong about that. And I'm not, you know, I'm not the less I self identify as a cisgender man. So I'm not the person to judge. Nonetheless, also these racial constructions. We've been talking about Shylock, but as I said before, there is the negress that supposedly Lancelot Gobo got pregnant. There are the Turks, there's the Prince of Morocco and all that racism and Orientalism in, you know, in those references and characterizations. And they're all tied together in Venice because Venice is a place where this is actually historical happening. In the early modern period, we're in this historical halfway house between feudalism and capitalism. So these constructions of women, of Jews, of white people, of what would much, much later be called heteronormativity, very much under construction, consciously and unconsciously, in the period in which Shakespeare wrote the play. So, you know, Portia is both a remarkable woman and a girl boss and <laughs> complicit at, in the anti-Semitism all at the same time. So once again, my answer, you know, my, my preference would be don't try to smooth that over. Let those contradictions, let those fissures show in production. I'm not sure how to do that. One you know, one thing that crossed my mind is what about a production, you know, where um, Portia is a dominatrix and the whole thing huh. is taking place in her S&M judgment in the basement of Belmont, you know? Huh. Oh, that would be so interesting. That would be just <laughs> And I actually, I just want to note, Terry, I think you're right on the money that like, in in modern day terms and in terms of feminism, like, I think the best kind of feminist is an intersectional feminist, Absolutely. somebody who's thinking about every kind of woman when she's thinking about how to liberate women. Mm -hmm. And so... I think you're absolutely right that, like, if she's only a girl boss for herself, well, I don't know if that's feminism. Right. There's a Palestinian playwright that wrote a play about Saladin's sister, mm -hmm. huh. a place a few centuries even before this, and she has a kind of view kind of like that. Huh. Um, but, you know, it's written in such a way that you know you're being winked at. Could a woman have had that point of view at mm -hmm. the stage? Well, probably not. Is this a is this a valid play anyway? The play kind of begs that question without answering it. And maybe a production of Merchant could do that as well. Yeah. Huh. yeah. No, that's, that's I, I think you're right on the money. I I I mean when I when I read this question that you'd sent to us, um, cakes, I I uh, the term that came to mind was white feminism. You know, the idea that maybe she's not just elevating herself, but she's only el really elevating people like her. She's only really looking out for white, in this case, Christian women or or Christians, maybe not even women, but Christians. She's really, she's trying to like look out for the, the other people who look like her and believe what she does. You know, I think this idea, this notion of intersectionality in this play is really interesting where everyone is sort of, on the surface, all the Christians are kind of in this together, right? Like that's that's kind of, you know, at the end, they all beat up on the bad guy, who's the Jew, blah, blah, blah. But there is, you know, we talk about the queer themes, we talk about the feminist themes, and obviously there are the Jewish characters, and there are the the uh, the other suitors, the the prince from Morocco and the, the gentleman from, from Spain. Um, and all of these people are kind of in their own lanes right they're not they're not really given the opportunity to well I, it's not that they're not given the opportunity to look out for one another they don't they just they're not portrayed as as being in this collectively and so maybe they have the chance maybe in some cases you know a character like Shylock could have the opportunity to turn to his community the Jewish community or turn to the other characters and say 
this is systemic persecution and and he doesn't and and that's and that's sort of on him um or that's sort of i mean it's hard to fault someone for not doing that i guess but it's it is it is uh but he's really out for himself is the thing um oh. and so, so is portia and so is um so are a lot of these characters yeah and yeah and yet in the midst of all this nastiness the one oppression that is conspicuously absent in the play is class oppression, except yeah, that yeah. wonderful speech that Shylock himself has, where he calls, you know, his Christian persecutors on the brutality of slavery. Mm -hmm. Many yeah. a purchased slave, which like your asses and your dogs and mules, you use in abject and in slavish parts because you bought them. Shall I say to you, let them be free, marry them to your heirs? Why sweat they under burdens? Let their beds be made as soft as yours. Let their pallets be seasoned with such viands. You know, that that wonderful speech about slavery that, you know, he just turns on and says, come on, fuck you. You know, huh? this, is, this is all based on exploitation fundamentally. Yeah. So fuck your Christian mercy. That's so interesting. Yeah, like that, that might be like kind of getting back to what you just said, Stephen, that might be the like only point in the play in which a character really decidedly like just doesn't think about themselves for a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's fascinating and yeah. beautiful. Hmm. <laughs> transition never, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awkward cakes transition woo i suck at transitioning um and, <laughs> anyway as we are discussing portia and her being kind of a complicated character i kind of want to throw her in with another question that i have about this play which is i think there has always been a little bit of conversation surrounding Antonio and Bassanio having some sort of queer relationship going on, whether or not that is reciprocal or just Antonio pining for Bassanio, I think can be played with. But I've seen several productions at this point in recent years that have played with the idea that where Portia's anger comes from in the courtroom scene is a moment in which Antonio and Bassanio kiss in front of her as she is dressed as this boy and can't really reveal who she actually is. And that seeing that happen, seeing her husband literally cheat on her in front of her is this moment of like, I'm so angry and I'm just going to take it out on whatever I can take it out on in this moment. And so I don't know, like it, it adds a very interesting dynamic to the play. I don't know if it ever like fixes anything per se, but keeping that in mind, I'm, I'm interested in if the two of you think exploring queer narratives in that way, whether it's positive or negative adds of reason for us to continue producing this Stephen, what do you think uh well i too am a a straight cis man <laughs> so i i have a limited authority on this but i i it's it's interesting that you say that though i've seen a lot of interpretations of antonio's like they really lean into antonio's sexuality um uh including the production that i was in i'm not sure the production i saw i can't remember it i was so distracted by other problematic things about it that I probably just just uh, lost the plot on that one. But I think that's interesting. I mean, I I do think that I think that the, having the two of them have a having a consummate relationship downplays Antonio's depressiveness. Um, I I wonder I, not not to like you know torture the guy, but I do I do <laughs> wonder if if you know if you if you give him that, and I think I mean I I. I I think I would be concerned seeing a production as you've described where, where Portia, you know, channels her rage at that. I mean, that's kind of like, I mean, it's not punishing the gays in this one instance, um, 
it's punishing the Jews, but but it's still you know the, the notion of like a gay couple drawing ire is is maybe not I'd have concerns about it. On the other hand, I think if you're going to go that route, I would say go go all out and just make the three of them a, like a power throuple. Like, I, I don't know, just like, a, you know, a white power throuple, if you will. Sorry. Um, um, <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Should have done that. Um, <laughs> but again, I think you could, just as you do with the with the themes of feminism with, with Portia, I think you could explore that. But just as there are winners or heroes of the play um heroes of the play are characters who are white and christian the losers are still the jews <laughs> and i think that i'm not sure you know like um the the people who really get victimized like and i mean there's the other thing is that there's an isolation thing there's certainly an isolation thing where if you want to explore that I think that you still have to sort of feed, tie in this notion of intersectionality this notion of you know okay, Shylock is being systematically persecuted, but there's a silent persecution going on or a silent isolation happening with some of these other characters with with Antonio, uh, arguably with Portia as well in her own in her own way uh, as a woman. If you want to interpret the, the queer narrative there too, that's that's certainly something you can you can do. I'm not sure how you highlight that i mean again i'm not a director but i think if one thing you could do is set them apart from the other characters find a way to sort of isolate them even as they're bonding with characters so that well and then at the end of the play where i you know that i have the biggest issue with where you don't get that beat that you want is there a way that you can draw these other characters out and sort of have them separate even if even if they've ostensibly found happiness and they're you know that that Portia and Bassanio are getting married, and and Jessica and Lancelot Lorenzo. are getting married. You still, yeah, Lorenzo, excuse me, are getting married. I mean, you you could have something about, I don't know, just uh, some, find some way of showing that they're kind of alone in this. You know, that whether or not they've they're the heroes in the story, whether or not they they really come out on top, they're still not totally out of the woods. They're still not totally understood by the other characters that they seemingly have connected with um, or not, as the case may be. One way of doing that is to let characters be on stage and be in scenes that they're not written to be in. Exactly, yes. Eavesdrop yes. and or witness on things that they wouldn't otherwise as written. I think that's a great point. I, I, I thought about this and I was thought, you know, is there a way you could keep Shylock on stage for the final act? You know, I don't, that would be super weird. It would, be, it would play weird, but I think it would, it could be really profound if he's just sort of off in the corner being sad by himself. Oh, um, hell yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? And it would be really interesting. I think that would be profound. That yeah. would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, you know, it's, it would be one of any number of ways. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a really experienced director either, but to just say to the audience, and even if it doesn't come across as clear as I'm about to express it, maybe that's okay too. But to say to the audience, yeah, there's no way that characters in this time, the characters in this story could be intersectional, but we watching must be. Hmm. Because Shylock himself, there's a whole discussion. And again, I point to, Dukakis's wonderful introduction to the, the 2009 art edition is at once a defense of and a critique of identity politics. Hmm. Identity politics always turns on a more abstract philosophical debate about identity and difference, about particular and universal. And, you know, they have to be in dialectical interplay. With each other, you know, because on the one hand, identity politics in and of itself always in the end leaves the oppressor intact. There's nothing capitalism loves more than multiculturalism you know, in some of its phases, although it's just lately being very uncomfortably comfortable with white supremacy and bigotry all of a sudden, too you know, which it engendered in the first place. But, 
you know, as a lot of experiments in so-called communism and socialism discovered in the last century, you can't do an end run around identity politics either. Jewish people have been persecuted for centuries because they're Jewish. Black people are oppressed as black people. Women are oppressed as women, gay people as gay people, etc. And you just can't say, oh, well, when we, you know, when we solve the class struggle, that'll all sort itself out. You know, right, right. That's not so either. And all of these identities are more than the constructions their oppressors have imposed on them. Oh, you know, uh, ta Coates had the wonderful phrase, they made us a race, we made ourselves a people. Right. Uh, yeah. How many oppressed peoples throughout history have had struggles that where they could make that claim? Right. So, you know, the great thing about this play is it raises all those questions, but you have, you know, you have to find ways to do it that lay those questions bare. If you play it straight, it's it, it's kind of icky. Oh, for sure. I think that leads me to my final question. And I'm going to preface it with a bit of a story. Stephen, you, I think you were the one who said like, okay, comedy for who? Like right. who's, who's laughing? Right. And I didn't think, I think it was Terry actually. Oh, was it Terry? I apologize. Terry. That's Either way. Me. Yeah. It's still. Yeah. Yeah. Hi podcast. Woo. No, you're good, you're good. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, last year, I believe in 2022, the Shakespeare Theater Company in DC put up a production of this play. And in my opinion, they did it as responsibly as possible, like really trying to think about like, how can we emphasize when each person here is being a victim versus when they're being a villain and trying to find the humanity where they could, but also I think very decidedly kind of saying all of these people aren't great people. Mm -hmm. And it felt incredibly heavy to watch. I think you could kind of feel throughout the audience that people were holding their breath and having a hard time watching it. But the day that I went to go see it, the man sitting in front of me was laughing at the anti-Semitic jokes as they were written. Even though there were literally people like spitting on the Jewish man and clearly it was not intended to be a funny moment, that man was still hearing that text and saying, oh, that's the best joke. That's a funny anti-Semitic joke. I know that. And so like my final question ab about this play is like, if that can be the case, if we can produce this play as responsibly and as thoughtfully as humanly possible, and the oppressor can still come and see it and see what he wants to see, mm -hmm. is this still a play worth producing? Is it just trauma porn? Like, I don't know. Do we, do we still want to see it up on stage at all? Stephen, do you want to start us off? Yeah, you know, I look, I, I, as you know, cakes, I, I have an extensive background in like house management and box office, and obviously, in that situation, what you want to do is, is, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the customer's always right, da da da. Like you, you want to be very careful about like what their experience is, and so I want to say very diplomatically, uh, as a, as a audience services, um person uh fuck that guy um, <laughs> um but i thought a lot about this question even before you sent it i thought a lot about like do we do this play what are we and what and and it, it does partly come back to why are we doing it what is the overarching reason for taking this particular story and whatever it's trying to say and doing it in on a modern stage for a modern audience I don't think I have the answer to that. And I think the only way to do it, um, in my opinion, if you want to take this play, is, as we said before, reimagine it. Do it as a puppet show. Use it within a framing device, that sort of thing. Beyond that, I mean, it, again, to me, 
this is Shylock's story. It's hard for me to look at this and really interpret it any other way. And because of that, and I don't, by the way, I don't, I don't think it's intended as Shylock's story. I really, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure prepared to say that that's, that was really Shakespeare's intention. Um, I think that in the modern canon, as we portray this play, it, it's thought of because there's, it's just the, the anti-Semitism is, is so palpable in it. We have to put a lot of weight on Shylock's experience. Because of that, I think of this play, I think the question of this play is, what does it mean to be a Jew in the world that you're in, in the world that, you know, to, to be an outsider in the in the world that you're in, and how do you defend yourself? How do you hold on to your your identity? How do you hold on to yourself and, and who you are and what you believe? Um, and I don't, honestly, I don't think this play does a very good job exploring that. I think that, you know, another, one, another thing that this play is missing is... Maybe I said this earlier. I don't know, but I I, I think one one thing that's missing is Jewish identity. This I, I know I said Jewish community. I know I said context, but another thing that's missing is the questions that come with Judaism, and not just not just the trauma. I mean, there's a lot of inherited trauma in, right. in Jewish history, but it's not it's not just that. There's right. a lot. There's a there's a rich history of asking ourselves what what is our relationship with God. I read something really interesting as I was as I was putting this together, uh, putting together my notes for this, that made an interesting point that like a, a pretty good antithesis to the stereotype of the Jewish, you know, the greedy Jew is that the the notion of sadaka or charity is really central to um, to the Jewish faith and, and Jewish culture. Um, that's not in this play. And so as I was trying to answer this question, the only thing I could think of was what are better Jewish plays? What are better, you know, like what are better Jewish stories? And honestly, I mean, I know that that I know we're here to talk about Merchant of Venice, but like the only, I I I was kind of like I don't I don't think that this is a particularly good if if it is intended as a Jewish play, a Jewish character study, it doesn't do a great job, I think. And and you can do a better job with a play like Fiddler on the Roof. It's you know it like. I'm biased. I was I in eighth grade. I was Tevia, so I I have, <laughs> I have to plug that one. Um, no, but it is it is really interesting. It 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 deals with this man in in a world that is changing around him, and he's trying to hold. He's trying to you know reconcile his faith with a changing world and a world that is on the one hand deeply anti-Semitic, and another on the other hand a world that's just evolving regardless of anti-semitism you know what's happening with the russian revolution and who his daughters are going off and marrying with no with no slight to the jewish faith or or what he wants it's just it's just you know that's just the way that it is the other one i think is really interesting is the story of the golem and it's a jewish folk tale it's not i, I i'm sure there are plenty of different interpretations of it but the, the golem of prague is a story about people of prague were being deeply persecuted uh largely uh from my understanding as a direct response to um the blood libel myth that is tied into that is sort of referenced in this play and so a rabbi builds a, a builds a man builds a golem to protect the jewish people and then what happens is it goes too far. It go, like he it becomes too violent. The, the interpretation that I read initially said that the city began to fear its own creation. But what I took that to mean was this is a, a creation that has been militarized, basically. You know, it's it's he's crossed the threshold of protecting himself and seeking justice. And now it's just about bloodshed and and you know, and I think that there are a lot of very relevant things. You know, I know I, I said I didn't want to go down the Palestinian route, but like, but Terry, I see you've got the flag back there. So I I want to I want to it's I, I think it's a it's an important route to go down. Where where do you where do you cross the threshold past protecting yourself and go down just carnage? And that's relevant in this play, too. I think mm -hmm. it's, you know, and I think that you can explore that. I just don't know how to do that. If if you're if you are a Shakespeare purist, and I don't think people should be, but if you are and you want to take this play as it is, or I don't want to say people shouldn't be, but I am not. I'll say that. How do you reckon? How do you explore these themes? How do you just take it? I, I don't I don't I think it's very difficult in a modern sense to take it as it is. And I think these other Jewish plays do a much better job with that. These other Jewish stories do a much better job with that. That's, and that's my, that's my statement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hell yeah. Terry, how about you? Some closing thoughts? You know, 
if I do say so myself, since way before we see you white American theater, since way before the commercial media started using the phrase cancel culture, I have been struggling and asking my students to struggle with this whole notion of canonicity. Mm -hmm. You know, and whenever we say, do we do this play anymore? There's a part of me that says, well, let's be careful because even with all this play's flaws and failures, and they are legion, we fail to study this play, mm -hmm. not produce it for the delectation of audiences. We fail to study it at our peril. But at the same time, the whole notion of canonicity is everything that is included in the canon is excluding something else, which was why I was so delighted, absolutely thrilled to hear your answer, Stephen, to this question. Because Kushner has treated the story of the Gollum, but I want to, you know, I want to see some great playwright treat the the version of it that you were talking about it, the Gollum of of fraud. I mean, <laughs> you know, one of my one of my great Jew Jewish heroes, among others, is Julian Omer Kamis, mm. the late artistic director of the Janine Freedom Theater. And you know, the Janine Freedom Theater needs to do a production of the Gollum of Prague mm. you know, with some playwright's adaptation of it. I mean, right now. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Terry, I wrote, I wrote, I did write a version of that when I was like 14. If I, oh my God, now I, I think I would, I would want some edits, but I, I've been thinking about going back into it and writing it, writing a more, you know, oh, year old me. And, and maybe, maybe that's the, the fire under me that you, that you've just lit. That's, uh, well, you know. cause yeah, we do, we do need to hear more from that rich, trove of the Jewish canon that actually exists right, right. The theater world as you say all too often ignores so whatever judgment we come up with about the Merchant of Venice that judgment has to be inclusive of you know a larger rather than a smaller canon you know every time I hear somebody saying we must not do this play anymore Again, this is why I think your answer was so wonderful. My question is, okay, well, who do you want to hear from? Mm -hmm. Those titles, let's have those suggestions. Let's see those productions. Yeah. And I agree with you, by the way. I think that, you know, maybe we don't produce this play anymore, but we talk about it in academic settings. We talk, you know, it's it's part of required reading for literature or or history classes or or dramatic literature classes, that sort of thing, you know, where it's, it's, it, it, yeah, I, I, again, I stand by this notion that I don't know really how you do this play well. Or, in the or we, or we do read, or we do retelling. Yeah. You know, the, the things, the things that, that we have been taught as theater people. Yes. Canonical. How many versions of it before Sophocles, Oedipus, the King, how many versions of you know to name it even more pertinent ex example Aeschylus the Persians mm -hmm. have come and gone that we just don't know about before Aeschylus's play or Sophocles's play or Euripides's play or you know the rest of these men you know as they usually are got canonical yeah. lost to us you know, canonicity is a process that is always in motion, which is something else that we need to remind ourselves of. Hmm. That's what saves us from, you know, bardolatry, even on podcasts of both. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. Ooh, and I will say, I did get to see an excellent production of a play called District Merchants, in uh, Washington, D.C., which is an adaptation of this play by Aaron Posner that kind of explores Judaism when Washington, D.C. was kind of being founded mm -hmm. um, with all the same characters, just like in a totally different time period and with modern language. And 
I thought it was very well done, like much more nuanced than this play is, but exploring the same themes and characters. I'm totally writing that title down. I I sure would like to read your play too. Yes. I mean, if that's ever possible. Sure. I can connect the two of you. Oh, yeah. yeah totally. That Love would it. be great. Love it. I, I have to rewrite it. I have to rewrite that first. But, <laughs> but as soon as I get there, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> Believe me, I know that feeling. Believe me. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, I think we have reached a natural place of wrap up. I want to thank both of you so much. This conversation was so rich and so valuable. I, um, I very frequently say, like, in my upbringing, I have encountered Jewish people as a culture very infrequently for whatever reason. So whenever I have the chance to pick the brains of my Jewish friends and hear what they have to say about their culture, I'm just always fascinated to learn. And I really appreciate both of you taking the time to do this. I know it definitely takes some emotional labor to talk about this play. So, well, you know, and also the great Jewish contribution to comedy. I always say I'm a Groucho Marxist. <laughs> all right y'all well thank you all for listening thank you both for being here thank and you we will be back next week talking about all's well that ends well and wrapping up our conversations about the problem plays with i don't know maybe it does end well we'll see anyway <laughs> until then bye all Good night. Bye, thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can follow Stephen, Terry, and Bulls with the Bard at the handles either on your screen or in the description. If you haven't already, or if you're just new to the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe. It helps Bulls with the Bard to grow. And tune in next week as we close out our season on The Problem Plays, talking about All's Well That Ends Well with Jackie Medeski and Karen Shantz. Until then, bye all. A thousand thousand sides to save all. Lay me where sad true lover never find my grave to weep there.